While they're breaking down, would you turn your Bibles to Luke? Of course, we've been studying in Luke, Luke chapter 18. And we'll read a few verses there. Luke 18, verse 15 through 17. Isn't it great how that song, He Loves Us, and He loves us with an everlasting love. Wow. Verse 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 15. Now they were bringing even infants to Him that He might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to Him, saying, Let the children come to Me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs to the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, that God, just thinking of the privilege that we have to assemble here as a body of believers, a family. God, a called out people someone that you have died on the cross for. God, we pray for today that whatever is said, uh, that you get the glory from it. We thank you that, God, Jesus, for just you being who you are. We thank you for your love. Bless these words in Christ's name. Amen. If you remember the passage before, um, speaking about the Pharisee and the, para, um, and the publican, we see that this passage of Scripture for, uh, is also found in Matthew 19 and Mark uh, 10. One might think that it's a coincidence that this follows that parable, the parable of the story of the publican. But it is, you see that God wants us to come to him, humble and contrite. Isaiah 57 tells us that. And we see in Luke 18, verse 13 through 14, we see that the one, that is the publican, he was the one that was asking for mercy, and he was the one that was justified and forgiven. He knew that there was nothing that he had to bring to the table. He understood that he was a sinner, and in need of God's grace and mercy. When you, as an adult, or when we have been blessed with God by the free gift of salvation, you, as I'm a dad, I want my kids to have the blessings of salvation. And we see that these people were, in some sense, bringing uh, their kids to the Lord to be touched, to be healed. Um, the gift of salvation, I mean, what a marvelous gift it is, you know. Today we, we may use the sense of when we bring a, kid, a child and dedicate that child to God, maybe it was some sense that that's what they were doing. But they had seen what God has done, all the miracles, all the different aspects. But the disciples were saying, hey, you know, the master is too busy right now. He's got a lot on his plate. But... It, God, Jesus Christ himself said, hey, no, bring them. As uh, Anders takes out today on that 411, uh, let the children come. He made up his own um, title for the sermon. But this, he said, suffer the children. That's what Christ said, suffer the children to come unto me. So we'll look at how you don't come to God. First of all, you don't come as an adult. And why not as an adult? Okay. Because God wants you to come and rely upon the work that he has done. See, as an adult, we think that we know it all. A lot of adults say, hey, I've got this. I don't need Jesus. Just like the Pharisee did in verse 12. He said, hey, look what I have done. 
I've done this, I've done that, I'm not like these other people, I don't need you, I've got this. Some adults is just like that, they rely upon what they've done, their own righteousness. And in Isaiah 64, it tells us that we are all unclean and our righteousness are as filthy rags. So when you're coming to God, put, a, put, them, put away the mindset of that you know it all. Christ said, come to me or suffer the little children. Come to me as a child. So as a child, you depend upon you depend upon your parents, you don't depend upon, you can't, as a child, most children here, uh, they don't do, they don't have a care in the world, they just rely upon their parents or an adult to take care of them, or, and in that sense, that's what Christ is telling us, come and depend upon what I have done. Uh, so Christ is saying, come to me, depend upon me, I have done this, I have given you the gift of salvation. In Ephesians 2, Verse 8 through 10 says, For by grace he is saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had foreordained that we should walk in them. Let's look a little bit closer at this verse in verse 10. It says, we are created in Jesus Christ unto good works. So Jesus wants you to come as a child, depend upon him. Now he's created you, and he's created you for a purpose. He has created you to become a disciple. That is, you have accepted the work that he's done. Now he has ordained us to walk a certain way. There is uh, evidence in your life that shows that you've been transformed. Scripture is clear on how we need to live our lives. You know, throughout life, we have ups and bumps, uh, downhill distractions, roadblocks. There's a lot of stuff that happened in life. But we still have to live a disciplined life for God. You see, as a Christian, child, Christ follower, a disciple, we are like a good soldier. And we've got a few soldiers, uh, guys. You, as a soldier, you, you went into your field, you went for training, you took it on, and you, you made it your own. You learned everything. You got transformed into being that soldier. Now, there's a lot of different type of soldiers. We're not going to go into all that. But the deal is that you got training for that particular profession. So it is, as a child of God, we are to be transformed. What does Romans 12 says? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? It's good. It's perfect, and it's acceptable to God because it's his will. He has ordained you to walk a certain way, okay? Second uh, Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, okay, <laughs> Behold, all things are become new. Do you think that we have forgotten what we're supposed to be? I mean, it seems like we have in, in, in a lot of cases. We are to be disciples of Jesus. Matthew 28, 19 says, tells us to go and make disciples. Never said to go make church members. So we are to become a disciple by living a life under the influence of the Holy Spirit. When someone is under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you can tell the difference. Just like when someone is under the influence of some type of drug or substance, you see a difference in them. The way they speak, the way they walk, you know, you can tell that they're on the way they drive. 
Yeah, you can tell. <laughs> Thank goodness for those people. <laughs> um, lost my thought there, sorry. Yes, I, I'm glad for them because we tow their cars away. So. But you remember back in the book of Acts, uh, Peter, what did Peter do? Peter got up when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He got up in boldness and he spoke the words. Over 3,000 souls were added to that, that work there. Would you think, can you just think for a minute if church body here or even one person, let's say one person was filled with the Holy Spirit in the way that we ought to be? Can you imagine what we can accomplish for God's work, for the kingdom? You know, we've been talking about the kingdom work the last few weeks. His kingdom. Some of us, unfortunately, might never, never, never be filled with the Holy Spirit to the, to the, the point of being like Peter or being like Paul or, you know. You know why? Because we're happy where we're at. We're like, hey, I don't need that. That's too much work. I don't need to work. I'm saved. I'm fine. I'm, I don't need nothing. I'm, I'm good. I'm going to heaven. But that's not what Scripture tells us to, to do. We are to be disciples, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We ought not to be just happy where we're at. Paul in Philippians says that we can live a victorious life in Jesus. D.L. Moody once illustrated being filled like this, he said to his audience, how can I get the air out of this glass? One man said, suck it up with a pump. Moody replied, that would create a vacuum and shatter the glass. After many impossible suggestions, Moody smiled. He just then picked up a pitcher of water and filled the glass. There, he said, all the air is now removed. He then went on to show that victory in the Christian life is not by just sucking one sin out here and there, but rather by being filled with the Holy Spirit. When we are filled by the Holy Spirit, there will be a change and other lives will be affected. If we're filled with the Holy Spirit, things we say and do will not humiliate us or embarrass us. Ephesians 4 says, let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you live a disciplined life. Let's look at the Psalms. Psalms 42 says, and uh, as a deer pants for the water, so that my soul pants for you. Matthew 6, says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Proverbs 4 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. A disciplined life. Long for God. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're involved. I touched on this Wednesday night while we were doing our Bible study. Involved in his work. Did you know that your church needs you? Did you know that? Each and every one of us here are needed. You're needed. You have a gift that is given to you specifically. God has blessed you with a gift. And you need to use it to bring glory for his kingdom. It's not about your kingdom here. It's about his kingdom that's coming. Okay? The writer of the book of Hebrews... It says, forsake, not the assembling. Don't forsake yourself. Church is not some kind of country club or some kind of gym that you just go to whenever you feel like it. That's, you know, but when you're involved in church, you can't wait to be in the house of God. My little girl, Emma, always, she is, Dad, we go to church. Dad, when is Wednesday? Dad, when is Sunday? Dad, we got anything? No. Nope. We're going to church. She is just excited to be in church. Amen. Whether it is to play with Addie, I don't know. I mean, but <laughs> she's ready to come to church. Okay. So 
I posted this on Facebook uh, during the week. When you are, when you can't wait to be in church, is as one of the writer that I was studying with, he says, we're called fat Christians. Fat. I want to be fat. I had a lot of different posts on there. People says, I want to be fat. It's simple as this, okay? You're faithful. You're available and teachable. Fat. I want to be like that. You're faithful is that you're not missing an action. You're not MIA. -M -I -A. You're available. You're ready to serve God. And you're always looking for opportunities, opportunities to help. Colossians 3 says, And whatsoever you do, do it all your heart as to the Lord. Teachable. You're willing to learn and eager to apply it to your life. You notice it says, eager to learn and apply it to your life. Okay? I can think about people that are faithful. Abraham, faithful man. Available man. David was available when David was told to go kill Goliath. He went. He did God's work. Teachable. Paul is told uh, Timothy, study to show, you, show yourself approved. Many, many examples throughout the scripture. There were fat Christians. They were ready to do God's work. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you study God's word. You're ready to give an answer when you're called upon Peter tells us, be ready to give a defense. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're committed. <laughs> Mr. Warren says this, Christian life is not a game. It is a race that demands that the very best that's in us. Too many Christians live divided lives. One part enjoys the things of the world. The other part tries to live for the Lord. They get ambitious with things of the earth. Earthly ambitions. See, our calling is a high calling and a heavenly calling. If we live for the world, then we lose the prize that goes before. Our high calling. We lose the sight. So when, when, if you're committed to God, you live according to God's word. You know, is it fun to run out and go party? I guess it is because there's a lot of people that do it. That's why there's probably so many church benches or chairs that's empty in different churches. Because Saturday night, Friday, Saturday night, weekend night, what do you do? You're free. You don't have to go to work the next day, so you think you can live it up. But if you're committed to God, what are you going to do? You stay home Saturday night, you might hang out with the family, you might read a little scripture, get in bed early so you can get up and go to church Sunday morning. You're committed to God when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you live a life of integrity. When you're serious about God, this becomes a major part of your life. It is important to you. It raises the bar. It amazes me so I hope it does amaze you that, you know, how we work so our tails off at work. You know what? To just accomplish or get better at what we do. But yet when it becomes to the work of God, we're just like say, hey, you know, I'm fine where I'm at. I don't need. It's, it's okay. That's too much work. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We need to remember that our victory is in Christ. Have a life of integrity. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we pray. Peter tells us to pray without season. This here... Prayer should come as natural as breathing. I don't know too many people that think about breathing. They just do it. Nike says just do it. Peter says just do it. Pray, 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 pray. I know Nike's far and gone, but, you know, it's an old stain. I'm old. 
We just need to remember that, hey, prayer in a Christian life, and when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it should come natural. Pray, pray, pray. Yes, we pray at our food table. We pray in the morning. We pray during the daytime as we go about. We pray nighttime when we lay down. That's what it all it, it takes. Pray. When we pray to our Father, we communicate to our Father. So when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you want to have a relationship with Him, and prayer comes natural. You pray to Him. Our daily life should just be full of prayer. And not just before a meal. I, I drive a tow truck, okay? I love it when I'm driving, when I have to go on a lo long call. I love it. That is my time. When I'm in the office, I'm running here, I'm doing this, I'm answering phone. I'm, it's horrible. I hate being in the office, but that's my profession too, so I do it. But the opportunity comes for, for a long haul. I'm like, I'm taking it. You guys can stay around town. That's my time. I'm able to talk to my Lord driving down the road. Yes, my eyes are open. I'm not closing my eyes going down the road <laughs> unless I doze off. But I pray. And there's a lot of stuff that, you know, needs to be made. Decisions needs to be made. And you pray to God. You ask Him for wisdom. And He shows us you. So prayer is very important. All right. Um, when you're filled with the Spirit, you live a life that endures. We're, ne we're never promised an easy life as a Christian. In fact, we're told just the opposite. First, Second Timothy 2 says, Share my suffering as a good soldier of Christ. Chapter 1 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep me from Keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. John 15, verse 4 and 5 says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abides in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. Who helps you to endure? Jesus. Jesus is the one that's going to keep you. Keep you through the Holy Spirit. He, as the scripture says, he's never said that your life is going to be easy. I've said it before, your life, I mean, life is full of roadblocks. Christian life is tough. If you all think it's easy, I don't think you're doing the right thing. Okay? Christian life is hard, hard, hard. Because you know how hard it is to get up in the morning and take a prayer and, and say, take a minute and say, God, you know, thank you for the day you've given me. It's hard. You know how hard it is when your friends or friends are going out to this movie theater to look at this particular show that you know as a Christian you shouldn't go to, it's hard. But through Jesus, if you abide in him, he says, if you abide in me and I in you, guess what? You'll bring fruit. It'll be fine. He'll take care of you. He'll in keep you till the end. So... When you come to Jesus, you come to him as a child dependent upon what he has done. And when you're, what he has done, he's given you the Holy Spirit. You live a fulfilled life, if you would, by studying, being committed, having a life of integrity, by praying to him. He keeps you because the child understands, or the, because of the child, the child doesn't know better. They have no pride, no ambition, no Nothing. They're, they're meek. They're humble. A child comes to rely upon someone else. Verse 17 says, Whoever 
whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a child. The child takes what is given to him. A child receives the kingdom with humility and thankfulness. They are not as the Pharisee. They don't think they have it all together. They don't think that all my wealth, all my this, all my that is fine because they have nothing. But they think as the publican. The publican deny self and say, God, I am not worthy. I can't do this by myself. I need you, Lord. I need your help. I am nothing without you. Be merciful to me, a sinner. That is what you have to come to when you come into God with humility. That's why he says, suffer the children to come to me. Suffer them. If you must receive the kingdom of God as a child, just as I don't have a wealthy parent. Some of you guys might. A wealthy parent may leave some fancy, dancy inheritance for some of you guys. What do you do to get it? Nothing. They just give it to you. You didn't go buy it. You didn't do nothing. So it is with Christ. You didn't do anything to get it. He is giving it to you. You must receive this gift from the Father. If you're a child of God, you have been given, and this is, you've been given the kingdom, okay? And what is that kingdom? That kingdom is full of streets of gold, pearls, big mansion. I have a big mansion. It's waiting for me. I have, I have a crown that I know that I will lay at my Savior's feet. I'm looking forward to that day that I can lay that crown at Jesus' feet and sing, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King, the Most High God. You will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. You are the most. If you live a fulfilled life with being indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you could say that you have that. You could say that you'll be singing. You could say that Jesus says himself that you will reign with me on high. His people, his children will reign with me. They will be in heaven with him. So in closing, I ask you today, are you a true child or are you pretending to be one? Are you living the victorious life in Christ? Are you living under the influence of the Holy Spirit? If your answer is no to these questions, I say to you, come to Jesus as a child. Depend upon what he has done. You have nothing, nothing to bring to the table. It's all been accomplished by him. Let the children come. I read John 10, says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. Those are words from Jesus Christ himself. It's in red in the Bible. I know that. My sheep hear my voice. Come to him as a child. Come humble. Come reliant on his work, not on your own.